myself went 14 years in residential school. So each time a person comes in front of us, um, I'm really engaged with the individual because many times my own story is being told, my own story is unraveling in front of me. And when I think back over the th almost three years that we've been going to communities and listening to, and not only the communities, but we've been to urban settings, we've been to universities, we talk to other uh, people, not just former students, other because we're asked to tell the complete truth. So we need to get all possible sides of the story. Um, but one thing that struck me is the depth of abuse. That is what really struck me the most. Because I knew about the abuse. I lived it myself. But I didn't know of it across the country. Because we've been from coast to coast to coast. And when you put it all together, just the level and the seriousness and the depth of abuse is really sometimes indescribable. It's not really... Uh, that's what struck me as being the biggest, single most important new information for me. But at the same time, that translates then into the good healing um, that can occur, the opportunity for uh, a healing future for the individuals, the communities. And then, as I said, it'll feed into an informed reconciliation, because that's the upside of our work, the future, is having better relations with each other, having good relations with each other, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. It's critically important that we are able to engage the rest of Canada in this story. It's not an Aboriginal story. It's not an Aboriginal problem. It's a Canadian story. And we need to be able to convince Canada that this is their story and they have a role to play in it in terms of reconciliation. It's one thing to be able to talk with each other among ourselves about our experiences, but it's quite another to be able to inform Canada in a way that they'll feel comfortable after the information that they want to engage with us in reconciliation. It's because it's going to take both of us to do it. Yes, on one, on one hand, we have our own work to do within our own communities, within our own family reconciliation, for example, but it's the other bigger picture which is the challenge, and that's how do we engage not only the Canadian citizen, how do we engage institutions, the academia, the universities, how do we engage private industry? Because they all have a very important role to play in reconciliation. So that's the challenge we have, and it's something that we grapple with, I think, probably on a daily basis, and it's something that's in deep, certainly in our mind to try and reach, for example, the new Canadians who come and and immigrate to Canada, they know nothing about the residential school experience. So how do we engage them, first of all, to inform them, and what role would they play in reconciliation? What role does business play in reconciliation? So we need to inform them about how exactly do they fit into this whole scenario. So that's a challenge, and it's, it's really uh, something that's in our mind because we're focused on trying to find the ways that we engage the Canada. First of all, we don't listen to anyone um, with their experience unless there's supports there, unless there's medical supports, there's spiritual support or cultural supports. So we feel that we offer a safe setting for the individual to be able to share their experience. Now there's other um, parallel events that go on, for example, the uh, IAP assessments, the individual impact assessment process, which is more about the, the physical harm or the sexual abuse, those harms. Um, and then also um, uh, interviews from other people. So some people actually do feel that, how many times do I have to share my story? Because each time for some doesn't get easier. In fact, it's a deeper injury. So we're very cautious about that. But at the same time, um, uh, early in our work, I remember being told that um, exactly that point. How many times do I have to tell this? Nobody believes me anyway. So why should I keep telling a painful story, a painful expression of my experience? So I think over the time since we've started, Things have changed because the setting is safe. 
it's important that they share their story with us. And in fact, some are told by their lawyers, apparently, go and tell your story. It's up to the individual to decide that, whether they feel comfortable enough to share their, want to share their story. Some say, I wish my family was here so they could hear it for the first time. I've told a lot of other people, but my family hasn't heard it. So it's a bit of a, it's a difficult question. It's a difficult issue. But we make sure that we help provide a safe setting so that when they come forward in front of us, we listen very carefully, we take it seriously, because we consider our work as a sacred trust. And to offer it up that way, I think is important. There's a, a lot of different medium media of collecting the what really happened in residential schools. Now, all of that information, we're called on by the court order to establish a national research center. So with consent of the people who, not all of them, by the way, will offer their consent, but that information will go into the National Research Center for future access. Maybe 10, 20, 30 years from now, their grandchildren might want to hear their story. Or a researcher might want to access the, the information. So it's supposed to go to a National Research Center, where, where what we gather through our process and other processes will be housed in the National Research Center.